And today is June 14th, 2018. Happy Flag Day, everybody. Thank you for joining us on North Star Oasis. We are ready for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming here just for you. We're going to start today with a Prager University segment about speech and how words actually mean things. What's in a word? Why does it matter whether we call someone who breaks the law to enter the country an illegal alien or an undocumented immigrant? What's the difference between a Christmas tree and a holiday tree? It's just semantics, right? Yes and no. It is just semantics, but semantics means the meaning of words. Words exist so that we might discriminate one thing from another. Without words, we have chaos. And it starts with the first words, a baby says mama to distinguish mommy from daddy. Words shape how we think. They color how we view the world. No one understands this better than the left. They are the masters of words because they know that words matter. The left has a special gift for euphemisms, soft words selected to sugarcoat harsh realities so as to make those harsh realities easier for us to swallow. But these soft words are insidious. Their sole purpose is to deceive. Race discrimination in hiring and college admissions is refashioned as the much nicer sounding affirmative action. Who would ever oppose an affirmative action? Global warming, which can be measured and challenged, has morphed into climate change, which means essentially nothing because the climate is always changing. When Barack Obama became president, George Bush's war in Afghanistan suddenly transformed into the far less ominous and threatening overseas contingency operation. That's one way to try to end a war, just rename it. The examples are endless. There's a new euphemism every week. In the make-believe world of leftist language, young criminals have become justice-involved youth. Mandates and taxes are individual shared responsibility payments. Government spending becomes an investment. Wanting to keep more of your hard-earned money becomes greed. Taking more of someone else's money is them paying their fair share. Opposing a Democrat in the White House is obstruction. Opposing a Republican in the White House, resistance. In the name of diversity, the left enforces intellectual conformity. It censors opposing views in the name of tolerance. And it labels all non-left views hate speech. Consider the ongoing battle over pronouns, whether to call a man who thinks he's a woman he or she. Very few people in the country suffer from gender confusion, and we should have compassion for those who do. But the left has invested countless funds, time, and energy to make everyone refer to some men as she and some women as he. Why? Is it because the left is so compassionate? Or is it more likely because so much of the left's cultural agenda is about blurring, even denying, the natural distinctions between men and women? Sometimes it's just an adjective that can change or even negate the entire meaning of the word it describes. Take social justice. Justice means getting what you deserve without favor. Social justice means getting what you don't deserve because you are favored. Here's one we hear a lot these days. My truth. Truth is reality regardless of any individual's feelings or perceptions. My truth is how I perceive things regardless of how they really are. And how about same-sex marriage? Let's not get into the politics. Let's just look at the language. Throughout history, in every culture, marriage has been the union of husbands, men, and wives, women. Same-sex marriage is the union of men with men or women with women, but it is most certainly not the union of husbands and wives. Once the phrase same-sex was placed before the word marriage, that is, once the definition of marriage changed, the debate changed. It became about marriage equality. It was suddenly an act of bigotry to limit marriage to husbands and wives. All this manipulation of language has paid off for the left, because whoever controls the words controls the culture. Don't believe me? Just try using plain language instead of the left's politically correct jargon. But be careful. Use the wrong words, and you might lose your job, your home, and your reputation. The culture war is largely a war of words. Right now, the left is winning. You can see the consequences everywhere, in politics, in education, in media. It's time to fight back. We should not cede another syllable. What's in a word? Everything. I'm Michael Knowles, host of The Michael Knowles Show for Prager University. 
And we are actually going to come back to discuss free speech issues and a little bit of the culture war uh, in just a little while. Now, of course, this has been a very busy week, politically speaking, and so we're going to touch on a lot of this today. Uh, first, we are going to actually start with the uh, Kim Jong-un, Donald Trump summit that was held in Singapore just the other day. No one was quite sure what to expect from this summit. Negotiating on behalf of his people, a very worthy, very smart negotiator. It was a day laden with history. Kim Jong-un seemed almost overawed by the occasion. For a time, the watching world wasn't even sure what he and President Trump were signing. Act one in this diplomatic drama had begun almost five hours earlier, with the handshake that may have changed the course of history. President Donald Trump had said he'd know within a minute of meeting Kim Jong-un if he'd get on with him. So this was the moment he began sizing him up. The start, perhaps, of an improbable relationship in improbable times. Two nuclear-armed leaders, one a former real estate developer and reality TV star, the other an international pariah. And it's my honor, and uh, we will have a terrific relationship, I have no doubt. Speaking through an interpreter, Kim Jong-un said the way here had not been easy. The old practices and prejudices worked against us, but we are here now. They met at 9 a.m. local time in Singapore, so prime time viewing in the United States. Experts around the world will be studying these images frame by frame, looking for deeper meaning. Excellent relationship. Thank but no answers to questions about whether Kim will give up his nuclear weapons. It is only a few months ago that these two leaders were hurling insults at one another and threatening nuclear annihilation. But Kim, who for security reasons has barely stepped out of his country since becoming leader, spent just under 40 minutes in a room with the US president with just their interpreters present. Later, the two leaders were joined by their advisers. So far, so good. Trump predicting that the two would have tremendous success. Kim told him that the past had held the two sides back and that these talks were a prelude to peace. But it's going to take more than just one meeting to realize the verifiable, irreversible destruction of the North's huge nuclear arsenal. And Kim wants something else, a guarantee that the US will not try to topple him if he disarms. But in the garden, all seemed amicable as the two leaders strolled and talked together. President, we're going right now for a signing. Before that, though, there was something Trump was keen for Kim to see the inside of his official limousine, known as the Beast. Some worry that this historic moment is eclipsing North Korea's harsh human rights history. You know, this is a fundamental freedom. This is a principle of, of human existence. And, you know, for Donald Trump to say that Kim Jong-un is now a nice guy when he's got 120,000 people in gulags in the mountains uh, is just not on. Yeah, sir. No, sir. Few diplomatic encounters have been so eagerly anticipated. The question now is whether all this will prove to be more than just a photo opportunity. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera. Sing and that was the very first meeting between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Now, during their closed-door session, uh, President Trump had... Put, uh, had a uh, video that he had shown, uh, essentially like a movie trailer, had shown Kim, and we're going to show that to you right now. Seven billion people inhabit planet Earth. Of those alive today, only a small number will leave a lasting impact and only the very few will make decisions or take actions that renew their homeland and change the course of history. History may appear to repeat itself for generations, cycles that never seem to end. There have been times of relative peace and times of great tension. 
while this cycle repeats, the light of prosperity and innovation has burned bright for most of the world. History is always evolving, and there comes a time when only a few are called upon to make a difference. But the question is, what difference will the few make? The past doesn't have to be the future. Out of the darkness can come the light, and the light of hope can burn bright. What if a people that share a common and rich heritage can find a common future? Their story is well known, but what will be their sequel? Destiny Pictures presents a story of opportunity, a new story, a new beginning, one of peace, two men, two leaders, one destiny. A story about a special moment in time when a man is presented with one chance that may never be repeated. What will he choose? To show vision and leadership? Or not? There can only be two results. One of moving back. Or one of moving forward. A new world can begin today. One of friendship, respect, and goodwill. Be part of that world, where the doors of opportunity are ready to be opened. Investment from around the world, where you can have medical breakthroughs, an abundance of resources, innovative technology, and new discoveries. What if? Can history be changed? Will the world embrace this change? And when could this moment in history begin? It comes down to a choice. On this day, in this time, at this moment, the world will be watching, listening, anticipating, hoping. Will this leader choose to advance his country and be part of a new world? Be the hero of his people? Will he shake the hand of peace? and enjoy prosperity like he has never seen. A great life or more isolation? Which path will be chosen? Featuring President Donald Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un in a meeting to remake history, to shine in the sun. One moment, one choice. What if? The future remains to be written. Now, with the whole Trump-Kim summit and that video, I have heard a lot of criticism this week. First, on the agreement itself. I mean, there, there was actually an agreement, not just the summit, but there was a four-piece agreement. And piece one, part one is essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, that we're committed to further talks and want to resolve peace on the Korean Peninsula. Okay? Part number two is, uh, I, I can't remember part two. I don't have it in front of me here. Uh, but part three is definitely denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And part four is the repatriation of prisoners of war missing in action and the remains uh, from the Korean War 1950 to 53. That's really what it's four points. Now, I know so many people who are, who are criticizing Trump for pulling us out of the Iran nuclear deal. I covered on a previous show the fact that it is non-binding and that one wasn't signed. And then the same people are saying, but, but Trump has come away with a piece of paper that's worthless. Let me ask you something, especially if you're married. When you first met your spouse and you agreed to a first date, if you're a guy, did you bring a wedding ring, engagement ring? 
Were you planning on marrying or asking the person you just met, and you're going to go on your first date, are you going to pledge to them a lifelong commitment on your first date? I don't know of anybody who has a long and lasting marriage actually did that. So what happens? Trump and Kim, you look at them like a potential marriage partner. They're on their first date. They just met. And what was that four-point agreement? It was saying, hey, you know what? This is kind of cool. I kind of like it. Let's go on our second date. That was the only promise. There, you know, you look at what happened with the Iran nuclear deal, and this was month after month after month of, of long-standing negotiation, intense sessions from top diplomats, and then they hammered this non-binding agreement out. You look at what happened with Trump and Kim, these two actually met for the first time and actually had a pleasant discussion, and they got along, and they said, well, let's work together. Now... The criticism of the video, well, one, that's so American. And two, what does a video have to do with diplomacy? Let me tell you what the video has to do with diplomacy. And it actually goes back to what John Kerry, back when he was a presidential candidate in 2004, had to say in his criticism of then-President George W. Bush. Quote, this administration makes us look bad in the eyes of the world. Kerry said that repeatedly. Now, apply a little bit of critical thinking here. How does the rest of the world view us? And I say that not saying, you know, how from a philosophical perspective, but what medium of information do they use to come up with, to be able to make an opinion? They use films. Hollywood. Hollywood is how places around the world view us. When I was deployed to the Middle East, we had so, so many times I w we'd see Bedouins and their nomads living in the desert in tents. And you know what? Just about every tent from the nomads had one thing in common other than being a tent. They all had a satellite dish attached. Even the nomads were watching American television and American movies through their satellite dish. So now, what do you think Kim Jong-un has formed his opinion based upon family lore and what his father and grandfather told him, based upon any other types of propagandist writings that, you know, and philosophies that existed there, plus what they see in Hollywood. So for President Donald Trump to show an iPad with that film trailer that you just saw, with a lot of Korean-esque messages showing Kim Jong-un and giving him a chance to make a popular, uh, to make the right choice, and there's, a, there's plenty there about how your country in North Korea can actually prosper, will help you prosper, you're the one who's got to cho choose and send the messaging through a movie trailer with a lot of stuff that is important to Koreans. I am impressed, not necessarily with the quality of the video, but with the use of the technology to send the message to Kim Jong-un in hopes of being able to get to that next level of negotiations. That's what happened this week. Now, yes, there are people who say Donald Trump should get a Nobel Peace Prize. And there was actually, I think, two people from uh, Norway uh, two legislators who are uh, considering putting Trump in for the Nobel Peace Prize. You know what, I think it's a novel thing, considering that his predecessor got the Nobel Peace Prize for doing less, that maybe, yes, Trump has earned it, but I also do think, in all seriousness, that the time is not quite yet, that there still needs to be a little bit more. Again, if I was looking at it as me giving out the Nobel Peace Prize, Obama wouldn't have gotten it because he didn't do anything for peace. I don't think this would actually still warrant to that level yet under my criteria. But according to the criteria of the past recipients, yeah, Trump should definitely get it hands down. Now, Kim Jong-un mentioned about the past and how the past has prevented us from moving forward. And that was a statement through his interpreter that the uh, chairman actually said. And we're going to take a look right now. And I'm going to explain this uh, when, we're, <coughs> excuse me, when we're done looking at the video. Uh, this is the UN First Forces Battle Memorial, which is uh, outside of the town of o uh, Osan. And it's not too far from Osan Air Base. And since this one doesn't actually have 
uh, much audio. We'll just keep the audio going while we roll this. The thing is, on June 25th, 1950, the North Koreans sent 89,000 people over the 38th parallel. Now, 38th parallel was the post-World War II separation point, as agreed to by the Russians in the United States at the uh, Potsdam Conference in August of 1945. The North Koreans, uh, North Korea was essentially a Russian satellite, Soviet satellite, and the U.S. had control of South Korea. In North Korea, it was Kim Il-sung, who is Kim Jong-un's grandfather, who um, had been an anti-Japanese fighter in Manchuria, who had been repatriated to Korea. He was chosen as the Korean uh, Communist Party uh, uh, secretary. It was Kim Il-sung who wanted that Korean War. The Soviets had promised Kim Il-sung reunification of the entire Korean Peninsula, which had not been a united peninsula outside of Japanese rule since 1910. And Kim Il-sung was kind of itching at the... He was itching to get going. And he was finally given the blessing from the communist government uh, from Moscow um, in uh, April of 1950, commenced operations in June of 1950. Now, in the United States, as soon as the uh, word of the overrun was made known to President Truman, he had worked with the United Nations to pass Security Council Resolution Number 82. And 82 essentially pledged troops to put the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel. <coughs> the United States troops uh, under uh, General Douglas MacArthur were in uh, Japan and airlifted Task Force Smith over to, um, uh, was it, da uh, I can't remember the name of the town right now, but they ended up bringing them over to I've got it here. Well, I guess I don't have it here. But anyhow, they ended up bringing them over to uh, the Korean Peninsula and the, and this is the 24th Infantry Division, 21st Infantry Regiment. And on July 4th, they set up outside of Osan, and then the next morning, July 5th, was the first engagement. That's why it's the UN's first battle. And one thing here with the first battle, um, it was a holding action and it was an, to give the U.S. enough time to be able to retreat back to Puzan where the rest of the 8th Army was being uh, dropped off by troop ship. So if you actually take a look at a map of the Korean War, which we don't have, uh, what you would find is that you would see this rolling perimeter going back to the south. That was to keep the North Koreans from overrunning the entire Korean Peninsula. Because if they would have overrun the Korean Peninsula before the UN troops got there, then we would be having a split Korea even today. And so the balance of the Korean War was that the 34th uh, Infantry Regiment of the uh, 24th ID and then the rest of the 8th Army came in there and started pushing their way back north. Then the 10th Corps, including the 1st Marine Division, landed at Incheon, which is near Seoul, further up to the north, north central, and they were able to push. And the combined Allied assault brought it all the way up to the Yalu River. Essentially, North Korea was a very, very small, tiny section, a little buffer zone between the rest of Korea and, uh, and China. But it was the Chinese, because of the threat of the U.S. and, and U.N. troops overrunning the Yalu River, they actually brought in their own troops and pushed uh, the U.N. troops back to the 38th parallel, and they fought engagements for the next two years, and then we had on July 27, 1953, the Armistice, which is pretty much the DMZ of today. That was the past. Now, point number four is about prisoners of war. Two and a half million civilians died on the Korean Peninsula in those three years. Two and a half million. And you're talking about 750,000 people were dead, wounded, or missing from both sides um, during those three years. So that's how bloody the Korean War was. But now there's still 72,000 Americans who still have not come home. 
And I'm going to tell you briefly about two of them. Uh, first one uh, we're going to talk about is Private First Class Robert Stanley Block. He was with the 19th Infantry Regiment, Company A, the 1st Battalion. Uh, July 16th, 1950, during one of those... Uh, during one of those rolling engagements, he was taken prisoner of war while fighting the enemy in South Korea July 16, 1950, and taken on a death march from Mampo to Chongkong, uh, North Korea. Sick and exhausted, he was unable to walk. His comrades carried him until a North Korean officer directed he be left behind and shot him on November 4, 1950. His remains were not recovered. By the way, he is from Lyle, Minnesota. Um, and then, and well, if we can, Dallas, flip that photo with the Time magazine. Yeah, that one right there. Ignore the photo on the right about uh, time, but take a good look at that photo on the left. This is Master Sergeant Jerry Curtis Christensen. By the way, he's from Balaton, Minnesota. And he had his uh, photo taken by Life magazine photographer Carl Maidens. Uh, at this time, Christensen was 25 years old. He was previously employed in electrical equipment manufacturing before he enlisted in the Army in 1946. At the start of the war, he was assigned to the headquarters company of the 34th Regiment, and he was uh, assigned the specialty of Infantry Operations Chief. That title can be applied to any number of administrative tasks. Maiden snapped this photo immediately after the 34th Regiment's disastrous encounter with the North Korean uh, People's Army at Chuan on July 7th and 8th, 1950. So we're only two weeks out from when the Korean War started. Uh, elements of the 31st, 34th's uh, 3rd Battalion and Headquarters staff were cut off and surrounded. Only a few, including Christensen, managed to break out. This photo subsequently appeared in the July 24, 1950 issue of Life magazine. According to the caption, Christensen said at that time, quote, all I need is a bath. And note the wedding ring on his left hand. Uh, Jerry would survive the next two weeks leading up to the Battle of Taejon. And Taejon, which is now Daejeon, is actually the town I was thinking of earlier. That's where the uh, Task Force Smith originally uh, landed. Uh, but the Battle of Taejon on July 20th, and he was one of many U.S. soldiers unable to escape the enemy's encirclement. Rounded up with other day's survivors, he undertook a forced march to a North Korean prisoner of war camp and died there on December 10th, 1950, due to a combination of illness, exposure, and wounds, and his remains were also never recovered. Now there is some speculation that Jerry Curtis Christensen was the model for the January 1st, 1951 cover of Time magazine that you see on the right. And there does seem to be some sort of resemblance to that. And so these are the stories of two Minnesotans, two Minnesota families who still do not know where their loved one is from the Korean War in 1950. Hopefully, point number four of the Trump-Kim agreement will work on bringing them home. 72,000, and this doesn't include the North Koreans who lost people. That if we're going to talk about moving forward, it's time to move forward. And I'm really happy to see that Trump and Kim are actually sitting down and talking. And from somebody who for 30 years has been an advocate of the POW MIA issue, going back to 1986 when I first learned about it when I was 14 years old, I'm glad to see we have a United States president who's taking that seriously. Because these families, and if you've watched other episodes of the show, we've, I've covered the USS Oklahoma and the remains of repatriation there. The families from the Korean War, they also deserve just as much closure as the families from World War II, Vietnam, and uh, the current conflicts. So this is a stepping stone. This is a first point, uh, first point of action. I'm really happy to see that, and it's one thing that we're going to have to continue to keep an eye on and pray. Pray for peace. I'm going to leave this section here with, with this. I've heard so many people from the left, the progressive left, the anti-war left, who for the last 40 years, 50 years, have all come out and thrown in everybody's faces that we need to give peace a chance. I've seen the bumper stickers, give peace a chance. War is not the answer. How many times have I seen those bumper stickers and how many times have I seen those lawn signs? 
But the same people who put those signs on are the same people who are opposing Trump sitting down to meet with Kim Jong-un over peace. You know what I say? Give peace a chance. And I think they should too. Now we are going to turn the page. We're going to go right back over to free speech. And the U.S. Supreme Court uh, has actually ruled today on an issue based right here in Minnesota. We're going to take a look at a, a fight over the First Amendment. This is put the, together by the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, the Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky. Uh, Joe Mansky is the Ramsey County Chief of Elections. Um, the, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments on that lawsuit back in February. So we're going to show you, first of all, what the... Uh, Pacific Legal Foundation came, uh, their video, and then right after that we'll show you the Minnesota versus, uh, Alliance versus Mansky uh, announcement on WCCO-TV. We'll just show these back to back. What makes speech offensive? What makes it political? Historically speaking, it just depends on who has the power to decide. In 1873, Postmaster General Anthony Comstock seizes any mail he feels is obscene including sex toys, novels, even personal letters. Critics noted the arbitrary nature of the laws. At least one judge noticed the laws lacked any clear, broad, well-defined principle or purpose. Comstock went on to prosecute thousands of citizens under his ill-defined laws, including influential suffragist Victoria Woodhull. At the beginning of the First World War, Charles Schenck is arrested in Philadelphia for circulating anti-draft leaflets. Schenck, a socialist, opposes the military draft as well as the war itself. The leaflets describe the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits involuntary servitude. The police declare the leaflet's content to be subversive. The government charges him under the Espionage Act. At the Supreme Court, his lawyers argued that the First Amendment guarantees the right of all Americans to voice political opinions, so long as it does not incite violence. His leaflets explicitly promote nonviolence in opposition to what would soon become regarded as a global tragedy. Because the U.S. was already at war, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes compares Shank's distribution of leaflets to yelling fire in a crowded theater. The nine justices unanimously agree Shank is jailed. Shank is only one of many to be prosecuted for opposing U.S. involvement in the war. The Wilson administration viewed any opposition to the war as treasonous. Thousands of dissenters are jailed. In 1972, comedian George Carlin is arrested in Wisconsin for performing his routine, the seven words you can never say on television. An off-duty police officer in the audience is offended. He heads to the nearest payphone, and soon police gather backstage. They declare his performance obscene. Carlin is promptly arrested when he leaves the stage. We've come a long way as a country regarding First Amendment rights. Comstock's laws were overturned, as was the Shank decision. Carlin was later found not guilty. But the battle to protect our free speech right from arbitrary and questionable government suppression is not over. In 2010, poll workers in Minnesota prevent Andy Selick from voting in a Gatson flag Tea Party t-shirt, citing a law against wearing political clothing at the polls. Voters who wear clothing deemed political can be stopped from voting and could be fined $5,000. Nine other states carry similar laws. But the Minnesota law does not define what counts as political. Poll workers have been given general rules of thumb, no specific candidates or policies. But this leaves open a concerning level of interpretation in an era where personal biases often bleed into public discourse. And even well-meaning poll workers make mistakes. In 2008, a Texas woman was blocked from voting for wearing a shirt that said Alaska. The poll worker believed this was electioneering for Sarah Palin. In 2012, a group of MIT students from Colorado were blocked from voting because the poll workers believed MIT meant Mitt Romney. The law is intended to protect citizens' right to vote without confusion, interference, or distraction. Its supporters say it helps limit voter intimidation at the polls. Does this shirt create confusion? Will wearing this interfere with others' ability to vote? Will this hat intimidate other voters? Should you be blocked from voting unless you take this off? Many state laws say yes. We say no. What will be considered political the next time you vote? How will poll workers decide what to allow? 
they will be forced to decide without any clear, broad, well-defined principle or purpose. Pacific Legal Foundation is taking Andy Selick's case to the Supreme Court to protect everyone's First Amendment rights. And what we're going to do now is actually show you the WCCO video announcing uh, the decision in MVA versus Mansky. Learned within the last few minutes that the U.S. Supreme Court has struck down a Minnesota law that restricted what voters can wear to the polls. The law was designed to keep voters from wearing political apparel at polling places. The justices ruled 7 to 2 that the law violates the First Amendment. Now, the state had argued that the law, which has been in place since 1912, is needed now more than ever in the current polarized political environment to guard against Election Day arguments, violence. At least nine other states do have similar laws. And so that is what happened. The Supreme Court, in a 7 to 2 decision, said that the Minnesota state law is too broad. They said, and I'm going to read right out of the decision, and of course this is like a 38-page uh, opinion. Um, we do hold that if a state, actually, hold on. Uh, we do not suggest that such provisions set the outer limit of what a state may proscribe and do not pass on the constitutionality of laws that are not before us. But we do hold that if a state wishes to set its polling places apart as areas of free of partisan discord, it must employ a more discernible approach. Essentially, what this boils down to is the fact that Minnesota has had a state law in the books since I think it was 1912 that said you cannot have uh, political stuff in a polling place. And that's not actually that bad. I mean, what, and what happens then is now what do you describe as political speech? Now, there's been an inherent assumption um, and let's see, this is not to say that Minnesota has set upon an impossible task. Other states have laws prescribing displays in more lucid terms. Uh, in California Election Code, another court case, the quote, the visible display of information that advocates for or against a candidate or measure, including the display of candidate's name, likeness, or logo, the display of a ballot measure's number, title, subject, or logo, and buttons, hats, or shirts containing such information. Uh, essentially prohibiting the wearing of a badge, insignia, emblem, or other similar communicative device relating to a candidate, ballot measure, or political party appearing on the ballot, or the conduct of such uh, of the election. So essentially, this is what the definition is. If you are for or against something on the ballot, then you can't wear it. But now with Minnesota statute, it's so broad that there is no definition in the state of what constitutes something political. So if you wear a Tea Party Patriots t-shirt, or if you wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, or if you have a uh, button that says, please ID me, or as we saw in that last video, you know, MIT, oh, well, you must be from Mitt Romney. Oh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You know, that's so vague, but that the state hasn't narrowed that down. And so now it's up to the discretion of a polling place judge, and it's an impossible task for the polling place judges to all be on the same page and enforcing standards. And therefore, it becomes subjective. That's what the court had to rule upon, and so they struck down the uh, measure as it currently is. Um, and I'll read the last section of the majority opinion, and then I'll tell you who uh, supported and, and uh, who um, gave the minority opinion. Cases like this present us with a particularly difficult reconciliation, the accommodation of the right to engage in political discourse with the right to vote. Minnesota, like, any, like other states, has sought to strike the balance in a way that affords the voter the opportunity to exercise his civic duty in a setting removed from the clamor and din of electioneering. While that choice is generally worthy of our respect, Minnesota has not supported its good intentions with a law capable of reasoned application. The judgment of the Court of Appeals is reversed, and this case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. It is so ordered. That is the Supreme Court. Now, writing that majority opinion is uh, Justice John Roberts, and 
He was supported by... Unfortunately, I don't have all... Of... This happened just before we started. Okay, uh, Roberts delivered the opinion of the court with Justices Kennedy, Thomas, Ginsburg, Alito, Kagan, and Gorsuch uh, joined. Sotomayor filed the dissenting opinion in which Breyer also joined. So it was Bre uh, Sotomayor and Breyer against uh, Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, Ginsburg, Alito, Kagan, and Gorsuch for. Uh, and, and, you know, the, you know, in four. And when I read through the dissenting opinion, I really, and I've got to study it more, but I really didn't see that much disagreement other than I think Sotomayor didn't really want to strike down the law, but just send it back to a lower court or back to the state to revise the um, language of political and tighten up the law. Uh, so that's what happened with Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky as decided or as released on June 14th, 2018. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very b busy week, and it, that includes uh, politics. Now, um, I'm going to actually go back about uh, two weeks ago now. The two political parties, the major political parties, Republicans and Democrats, had their respective political conventions, and they were making their endorsements. And so for the rest of this show, we are going to focus on the Democrat convention in Duluth. So right now, the, uh, for the U.S. Senate seat held by Al Franken and interim by Tina Smith, the DFL endorsed Tina Smith. Let's take a look at a segment from her acceptance speech. Oh, oh. DFLers, I am so honored to accept your endorsement for United States Senate. I want to just do a couple of quick thank yous. There's so many. I want to thank my incredible family. We're going to come up in a minute. I want to thank my amazing campaign team. And just let me particularly call out the incredible Alana Peterson, my campaign manager. DFLers, tonight we celebrate. Are you ready for a little Prince party? <laughs> me too. And tomorrow we have an important job, such an important job. We have the job of endorsing the next governor of Minnesota. Are you ready to do that? <laughs> and then we get to work. Because let's not forget, let us not forget, that Donald Trump and the Republicans have a plan to turn Minnesota red. I know it, but they've got millions of dollars in the bank. And they've got a bunch of nasty attack ads that are ready to go. And they want to win this Senate seat and the governor and all of those congressional races. And we've got five months to stop them. Dear fellers, I don't believe in blue waves. I believe in hard work. Are you ready to work hard with me? Are you ready to say to Donald Trump and the Koch brothers, stay out of Minnesota? Are you ready to say with me, we are not afraid of you? And are you ready to say to them, do not underestimate us in Minnesota? Thank you so much, dear fellers. Thanks for your energy. I will see you on the campaign trail, and I'm honored to have your endorsement. Thank you so much. And that is U.S. Senator Tina Smith accepting the endorsement from the Democratic Party for the U.S. Senate seat. Now we're actually going to take a look now at the DFL endorsement for State Auditor, and that is Julia Blaha. Win in November because you have the power to do that. And of course, I need to thank Hillary and DGP and Jeff and Christy and Nancy and Chris and Chris and the phoners and Jim and everybody in the video. And you know what? And my grandkids and my poor husband who has heard this speech too many times. And the most important thing we need to do right now. That was we're gonna, it's time to come together. We said this campaign was going to be about joy. No matter what happened today, it was about joy. And the auditor itself, the auditor is about the truth. And the truth is, Minnesota needs us to win in November. So let's get out there. Let's win this election up and down the ticket. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And so that was Julia Blaha getting endorsed for State Auditor. Now, unfortunately, I do not have video of Steve Simon, the Secretary of State, getting his endorsement. Um, I just, I will have to say, and, and this is no slight against the current secretary, that I just do not have the time to go through like 15 hours of video to find it. Um, thankfully, you know, somebody else is able to spl had spliced up some of the clips that we're using, but uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon did get the, the endorsement, and unfortunately, we just don't have the video. Now, the Attorney General's race was quite interesting because current Attorney General Lori Swanson was leading and then decided to withdraw and then throw her support to Matt Pelican, who is the endorsed candidate for AG. Now, of course, right after the uh, right after the convention, that really changed the dynamics of all, a lot of races in uh, on the Democrat side. I mean, the governor's race. I mean, Swanson jumped into the governor's race, which is already going to a primary anyway, and then. Keith Ellison decided to go from being a congressman to run for attorney general. So then that means more people are running for the congressional race. And then other people jumped into the, uh, into the um, auditor's race. And then we had some people drop out of the auditor's race. I'm still trying to figure out all of the nuances here because there were so many things happening so fast. All the while, I was trying to keep in touch with what was going on with the... Uh, Kim, uh, the Trump-Kim summit and with the Minnesota Voters Alliance case. It's been a busy time. So here is uh, the DFL endorsing Matt Pelican for Attorney General. I have just been informed by Attorney General Lori Swanson that she will be withdrawing from seeking the DFL endorsement. At this time, a motion would be in order to endorse by acclamation. Is there a delegate to add a microphone? There, there is a motion. Is there a second on the floor? It's been moved and seconded to endorse Matt Pelican as the next Attorney General of the State of Minnesota. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Congratulations, Matt Pelican. <laughs> Matt, you get five minutes if you want to come up. Matt, come on up. Five minutes for an acceptance speech. All right, so uh, we, I don't know what happened to the audio on that. Um, so we're not going to hear from Matt Pelican. Uh, that is, again, not by design. Um, the governor's race on the DFL side was quite... Uh, we, won't, we won't worry about it because in the interest of time, we actually have two more clips that we need to show. Um, so again, no offense to Matt Pelican, and good luck in your primary. Uh, the DFL had a major fight on their hands for governor. They had Rebecca Otto, uh, Aaron Murphy, and Tim Walls. And this thing went on for something like 14, 16 ballots. But at the end of the day... It was Aaron Murphy who became the endorsed candidate for the DFL for governor. Thank you enough for the honor of this endorsement. Thank you very much for this powerful act of democracy, for standing here together, to working our way through it, and pulling us together in pursuit of defeating Tim Pawlenty and winning this office in 2018. We've had a lot of conversations here together. Who here is a faith delegate? I sure see you. 
I sure see who here is a labor delegate. Who here is a delegate who wants to protect our clean water? I talked to a lot of you today. All of us. Who here is for our strong public schools and for single payer health care? Who is here to protect a woman's right to choose? Who wants to end gun violence in our schools? Who wants to make sure that we're going to raise the wage to 15 for paid family leave to protect our cherished elders, to raise our children well? Who is here to build a bright future? Well, so am I. I believe in a powerful kind of politics, the kind that improves our lives. And today is the day that we are going to march out unified. Are we unified, my fellow Democrats? It is important that we come together, that we show our full and honest vision for the people of Minnesota, that we show our full heart, that we crush hate with love. And that we believe again in ourselves and our capacity to do whatever it is we need to do to build our future. Together, we are unstoppable. We are. I want to thank the partners who helped build this campaign. I want to thank my beautiful campaign staff and the team of people who have come together. But mostly, I want to say all across this hallway, all across this hallway, a room of people who came together to do this thing. I am honored to earn your endorsement, and I want us to march out together to win this election, to defeat Tim Pawlenty, and together we will build a bright future for the people of Minnesota. Thank you so much for this honor. Let's go. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready to win. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, one thing is for sure that Aaron Murphy does have a lot of energy. Now, we do have one more candidate we're going to take a look at, and that will be U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar. Um, before, before I mention the, uh, Klobuchar, I want to go back briefly to Tina Smith. She is, uh, to my knowledge, facing a primary challenge from Richard Painter. So she will be uh, facing a primary there. Uh, Blaha for Auditor is uh, good. We know about the AG's race. So now we're going to go and hear what our U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar has to say. Hello, Rochester. It is so good to be back. And thank you to Ken Martin and all of our dedicated, determined DFL candidates. Are you ready to take back the U.S. House and the Minnesota House? Are you ready to win the governor and the Senate races? A special note to my friend and partner in the Senate, Tina Smith. Tina has hit the ground running, taking on everything from supporting our farmers to standing up for our small businesses. Our colleagues in the Senate, they know what a great job she's doing. She's doing well, and we need her in the United States Senate. My wonderful husband, John, that you saw up here, is here with us. And our daughter, Abigail, who is in her first job out of college, and I'm glad they gave her the day off. So delegates, when I look out at all of you, I remember where I come from. I see the iron ore miners, like my grandpa, who worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines, who saved money in a coffee can in the basement so that he could send my dad to college. I see immigrants, like my relatives, on my mom and dad's side, who came to this country by ship. The humility that keeps us working together, searching for common ground. Friends, I see the humanity that we cherish, the equity we demand, the unity that brings us together around neighborhood potlucks, lakeside campfires, small town coffee houses, and political convention halls. In Minnesota, we believe in hard work. 
We believe in getting things done. We believe in investing in one another. We believe in welcoming one another. We believe in looking out for one another. And during this chaotic and dark time, it can be easy to forget where you come from, to abandon who you are and what you value. You see it all the time. Right now, it's pretty much a non-stop shout fest on TV. But instead of fighting about what's left and what's right, what we really ought to be talking about is the difference between what's right and what's wrong. That's what I was taught. And her speech went on for like 20 minutes, so we're going to cut it right there because we've only got a few minutes left. I do want to highlight briefly uh, the primaries that are coming up. And we're, I'm trying to do this with both parties here, uh, give you an opportunity to see who's running and, and uh, whatnot. So we're going to take a look right now for U.S. Senator on the DFL uh, primary. You have Steve Carlson, Stephen Emery. Uh, David Groves, Amy Klobuchar, and Leonard Richards. Klobuchar is going to win that one hands down. We, you know, we know that one. Um, Ali Chaham Ali, uh, Greg Iverson, Nick Leonard, Richard Painter, Christopher Seymour, and Tina Smith are running for the other U.S. Senate seat. And really, it's going to be down to Richard Painter and Tina Smith. Those are the two powerhouses in that race. I'm not going to focus on any of the congressional races except for the 5th Congressional District because of what happened with the Attorney General's race and that being the open seat for that uh, at the last minute. So you have Jamal Abdi Abdul. Abdullahi, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, the former Speaker of the House. Bobby Joe Champion filed, but he has since um, dropped out of the race. Frank Nelson Drake, Ilian Omar, Patricia Torres Ray. I have no idea how that's going to play out. I think that's going to be the surprise of the state during the primaries. There, there's really no major... People say Ilian Omar, but I can see Margaret uh, Kelleher having just as much of a uh, clout. Uh, quickly looking at the governor on the DFL sign, Tim Holden and Jim Mellon, Aaron Murphy and Aaron May Quaid, um, Oli Savior and Chris Edmond, Lori Swanson and Rick Nolan, Tim Walls and Pe Peggy Flanagan. So it's going to be between uh, Murphy, Swanson and Walls. And that's going to be another race to watch out for. And then, of course, lastly, the Attorney General. You have Keith Ellison, Tom Foley, Deb Hillstrom, Matt Pelican, and Mike Rothman. Don't be surprised if Pelican uh, doesn't perform as well, even with the DFL endorsement. I expect to see uh, Keith Ellison and Deb Hillstrom as being the two powerhouses in that particular race. So with that, we are going to leave you with a little bit of music, and we are going to go to 1964. Ed Ames uh, put together Hello, Lyndon, for Lyndon Baines Johnson. <laughs> It's just great to have you there where you belong You're looking swell, Lyndon, we can tell Lyndon, you're still growing, you're still growing, you're still going strong We hear the band Pearson and Producer, I'm your host Jeff Williams You're watching North Star Oasis reminding you We have 100, 193 shopping days left until Christmas Thanks for watching See you next week. Wow, fellas, look at that guy go now, fellas. The whole